firsthand, so to speak, what happened and how things unfolded in Iceland. I've uh, noticed that in the media there seems to be some differences with regard to how they saw things there. In the beginning, we were making extraordinary progress there. We moved toward agreement on a uh, dramatically uh, reduced numbers of both intermediate range and uh, strategic uh, forces. And uh, then, despite our previous agreements on uh, nuclear testing and things of that kind, uh, uh, the General Secretary decided to hold progress in every other area hostage to his demand that we abandon the development for SDI and relegate research just to the laboratory. Uh, among other things, they backtracked on INF. They had offered an agreement that would have had zero zero in Europe on the immediate range weapons. And, uh, so the the discussions were very extensive, and they lasted nearly ten hours instead of the six hours that had been scheduled. And there was a deadlock uh, because the general secretary was still insisting that we remove for a 10-year period our right to develop and test and deploy strategic defense systems. And to try and break this deadlock, we put on the table a comprehensive and I believe historic offer to the General Secretary, offering them a 10-year delay in deployment, along with a 10-year program for the complete elimination from the face of the earth of all nuclear ballistic missiles and explosive devices of any kind, including bombs and everything else. And they rejected it, all on the issue of SDI. And it just became a non-negotiable demand for them. I had already told them that our proposal included making SDI, once developed, available to them, so that with the world free of nuclear weapons, we could still be protected against the idea of anyone cheating, or the idea of someone coming along uh, <clears throat> now that we all know how to make them in later years and starting to build them. And I reminded them of, after World War I, the elimination of poison gas, but fortunately we all kept our gas masks. And sure enough, some people have come along, including them, now that are ready to use this. But uh, we thought that SDI was an insurance policy that they would keep the commitments that uh, they seemingly were, were willing to make with us. So uh, we came down to the final battle on this one point, and uh, there came a moment when George and I stood up and the meeting was over. They refused to, to go with what they, uh, they seemed to want. But regardless, I think there's much to be encouraged about now. If we look back at some of the things that before they came to that deadline, uh, they had uh, seemingly agreed on. And I'm encouraged that we have now advanced into areas that have never been before been put on the table. And uh, I think that we shouldn't consider this as the end of, of the book, but uh, we'll keep on reading here and to see where we go. But let me ask George to expand on the events of the weekend there. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me see too much of me in the last 24 hours. I know that past the House there are a few things there that cause some concern, but uh, on its way to the Senate, I want to hear from you. I remember I even called you once in California during the Olympics, and you were right there. You've been, you know, with me since the beginning. And then the Almighty, I had to come here and go over the top with some of the, not this guy, this marvelous man, and William French Smith, been so helpful. But I had to. Quick story for him, I'll save it since it will be recorded for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let me, uh, we have it on the floor right now. Uh, 
I'll just put, put it there. Pete Domenici and I are working on the Budget Act business with him. We have a vote on that. Pete says if we're ever going to do the waiver of the Budget Act, this is a legitimate place to do it because by not doing something and allowing 1,800,000 people to cross the borders illegally, that's going to cost us a hell of a chunk down the line. <laughs> More than what we have come to agree to, and you are so. so if we could proceed with the that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, against, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental or reservation. Purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office, the duties of the office, on which I am about to enter, on which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Graham, Mrs. Graham, the yeah. Adam Elizabeth, ladies and gentlemen, it's been said that Human knowledge, especially technical knowledge, has expanded more in the past 50 years than in the previous 5,000. Well, indeed, it was little more than a century ago that an inventor came here to the White House to show President Russell B. Hayes a device called the telephone. And that's an amazing invention, President Hayes remarked. But who would ever want to use one? <laughs> I told him at the time I thought he might use it. <laughs> In this era of telecommunications and space travel, the medical breakthroughs and the microchip, it's essential for a president and his administration to receive sound counsel on the scientific aspects of national policy. In 1976, the Office of Science and Technology Policy was established to provide this counsel. And it's with great pleasure that we've gathered today for swearing in Dr. William R. Gray as the office's fourth director. Bill will inherit an office that has played a central role in this administration from the beginning, especially in a matter of the first importance to our nation and to the world, the Strategic Defense Initiative. You may have heard it. <laughs> that word in the middle, defense, is the significant one, because it would attack missiles, not people. SDI would threaten no one, not a single nation, not a single human life. As I said earlier this week, America and the West need SDI for long-run insurance. Bill is uniquely set suited to continue the work of the Office of Science and Technology on SDI and the many other matters with which it is concerned. I could list his credentials from project officer at Kirtland Air Force Base to the deputy directorship of NASA, but the list is too long. I could describe his personal qualities, determination, an extraordinarily fine mind, the enterprise he showed in helping to found a successful high-tech company. But again, time would prevent me from painting a full picture. So let me say simply this. Bill has made it his life's work to keep our country strong, free, and the technological leader of the world. And let me simply add, Bill, welcome aboard. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, ladies and gentlemen, it was a privilege to serve you, sir, as the chairman of your General Advisory Committee on Arms Control and Disarmament when I did that during your first term. It was also an honor to serve you as the Deputy Administrator of NASA, but it's, uh, it's a great privilege and honor indeed to serve you as your science advisor and as the director of your Office of Science and Technology Policy. In fact, as a teenager, I used to take apart radios 
take the pieces and turn them into transmitters. And I found that I could eventually talk all around the world. I couldn't always understand what people were saying on the other side of the world, but at least I could talk to them. And that was something I felt very good about. There was a challenge to that, in fact, that I think represents the challenge that the U.S. people, the citizens feel in the high-tech areas today. It's something that we have in our bones and is natural for us. It's something that we'll certainly continue to, to pursue and to, in fact, increase as time goes on. Through the strength of your leadership, you have certainly blazed new trails for this country in the high-tech areas. The space station, which will be America's first permanent address on orbit, and the aerospace plane that you've started, and which will someday get us to the other side of the Earth in less than an hour, and basic research, which you've been so strong in supporting all through your term, uh, which in fact, once again, uh, took the majority of the Nobel Prizes to US researchers just this year, and in fact, some of them today. And finally, in national security, where your initiative in guiding us into a world where shields and not swords dominate our protection and our future is a vision that many of us in the science and technologies find a shining goal that we're going to pursue for a long time to come and with great vigor. You're an inspiration to our young people, and you have certainly challenged us all. I look forward to working as a part of your team during the rest of this administration to lay the foundations for the decades to come. It's a true pleasure, Mr. President. Thank you very much. You humbled me when you said that because I couldn't take a part of toy wagon to get it back. Thank you, Mr.